So it's a huge honor and pleasure to welcome Craig Santos Perez on a virtual visit to the University of Virginia. Some people only got to know Craig Santos Perez a few months ago when he won the National Book Award for poetry for his latest volume in his series, From Incorporated Territory, Amut. But long before he was vaulted into these stratospheric heights of recognition, many of us had been reading and following his career with close attention. A D and post-colonial indigenous Chamorro poet from the Pacific island of Guahan, Guam, Craig holds a, an MFA in creative writing from the University of San Francisco and a PhD in ethnic studies from the University of California, Berkeley. A professor of literature and creative writing at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, he has published an abundance of poetry, essays, criticism, reviews, and academic scholarship, including the monograph Navigating Chamorro Poetry, Indigeneity, Aesthetics, and Decolonization. He is also the co-editor of several anthologies and has released spoken word albums and video poems. His poetry is centered on native Chamorro experience and language. He performs a piercing, if often witty, critique of the ecological ramifications of colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism, while also gesturing towards what one poem calls a horizon of care. The poetry periodically switches into Chamorro, the territory's indigenous language embattled under American occupation, using words like um, achiote for a prickly pant, or sina for the ancestors, showing such words to be both emblems of indigenous ancestry and of oceanic mobility, both anchors of rootedness going back thousands of years and participants in a history of rooting, travel, and movement. In his most recent prize-winning book, An Everyday Food Like Spam, he humorously plays this dual role as a product imposed from afar, yet thoroughly indigenized as a locus of Chamorro identity. Similarly, the poetry's oral texture often recalls uh, oceanic traditions such as chant, even as its graphic and typographic structuring renews transnational inheritances of visual and concrete poetry. At the heart of his recent volumes has been a rising concern with the climate crisis and ecological devastation, which he shows to be bound up with enduring patterns of imperial and capitalist extraction and exploitation. Burdened though he is with such grave concerns, I should also mention that he's one of the most active, generous, dynamic poets on the literary scene today. After I gave a talk 14 years ago on postcolonial poetry, he heard it broadcast by WBEZ Chicago and wrote me and kindly offered to send me um, his, most, his recently published um, first couple of books of poetry. And although I'd been um, working in postcolonial studies, it was a profoundly moving experience to read these volumes and learn from them about the extraction, the difficulty history of Guam under US rule. And sure enough, I soon myself compelled to write about his brilliant use of code switching in a subsequent article and book, and then again in relation now to climate grief. Teaching his poetry has also been a moving experience. As uh, my students, many of you here, uh, have been stunned by, for example, the powerful use of spatial page. Take lines um, that um, at least a couple of you have written about in a, a recent poem about off-island Chamor off Chamorro experience that enact the sense of division and dissociation when confronted with colonial gaze that evacuates identity, a world map that absents his island, a mirror of the absented self, the Pacific Ocean, like my body, split in two and flayed to the margin, I. How fortunate we are to have such a daring, incisive, brilliant poet with us to bring our symposium on poetry and climate change to a close. Please join me in welcoming to UVA, to UVA the author of dazzlingly resourceful, funny, yet heartbreaking poems that are shaping the future of creative writing, Craig Santos Perez. Oh, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> I was not expecting uh, such an introduction. 
And so thank you for, for your generosity and kindness. Uh, you know, thank you, of course, for, for teaching and writing about my work. And uh, to all the students, thank you for, for studying and, and writing about my work in your class. And thank you also for the invitation to be part of this symposium. I wish I could be there in person, uh, spending time with some of my favorite poets and scholars. Um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to at least engage virtually. So I'm going to uh, read poems uh, from my 2020 collection, which is kind of showing here. Uh, it's called Habitat Threshold. And uh, it's a collection of, of eco poetry. And you know some of the major themes uh, include, of course, climate change, uh, human animal relations, environmental justice, nature, wilderness, and, and so on. Uh, the book was published in 2020, but I actually started uh, writing the poems in 2014, which was the year uh, my first daughter was born. And it was also the year of the New York Climate Summit, the UN Climate Summit in New York. And so at, in that year, 2014, I was both, uh, you know, wrestling with, with being a new father, but also being a new father, you know, during a time of climate change. So a lot of my uh, thoughts and feelings about the topic uh, kind of made its way into these poems and uh, my daughter does make appearance in, in many of them as well. I'm going to start with the first poem of the book. It's titled Age of Plastic. The doctor presses the plastic probe against her pregnant belly. Plastic leaches estrogenic and toxic chemicals. Ultrasound waves pulse between plastic tissue, fluid, and bone until the embryo echoes. Plastic makes this possible. She labors at home in an inflatable plastic tub. Plastic disrupts hormonal and endocrine systems. After delivery, she stores her placenta in a plastic freezer bag. They say plastic is the perfect creation because it never dies. Our daughter sucks on a plastic pacifier Whales, plankton, shrimp, and birds confuse plastic for food. The plastic pump whirls, breast milk drips into a plastic bottle. Plastic keeps food, water, and medicine fresh, yet how empty plastic must feel. To be birthed, used, then disposed by us, degrading creators. In the oceans, one ton of plastic exists for every three tons of fish. How free plastic must feel when it finally arrives to the paradise of the Pacific gyre. Will plastic make life impossible? Our daughter falls asleep in a plastic crib and I dream that she's composed of plastic so that she too will survive our wasteful hands. Uh, so that's the first poem in the collection. And of course, plastic pollution is, is a huge issue uh, throughout the Pacific and uh, in Hawaii. And the actual, the, the cover of the book, uh, you know, it's not great, let's see. Actually features a, one of my personal photographs of um, my dad taking my daughter uh, to the ocean for the first time, to, to, meet the, to meet Mother Ocean and I remember that day also because there was a lot of uh, plastic uh, pollution that had drifted upon the shore of that beach that, that we took her to. Okay, so this next poem uh, is called Rings of Fire. And uh, I wrote this in 2015 uh, after my daughter turned one years old. And this poem takes, takes place in Hawaii. Rings of Fire. We host our daughter's first birthday party during the hottest April in history. Outside, my dad grills meat over charcoal. Inside, my mom steams rice and roasts vegetables. They've traveled from California, where drought carves trees into tinder. Paradise is burning. When our daughter's first fever spiked, the doctor said it's a sign she's fighting infection. Bloodshed surges with global temperatures which know no borders. If her fever doesn't break, the doctor continued, take her to the emergency room. Airstrikes 
detonate hospitals in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan. When she crowned, it felt like rings of fire. Volcanoes erupt along Pacific fault lines. Sweltering heat waves scorch Australia. Forests in Indonesia are raised for palm oil plantations. Their ashes flock like ghost birds to our distant rib cages. Still, I crave an unfiltered cigarette, even though I quit years ago and my breath no longer smells like my grandpa's overflowing ashtray. His parched cough still punctures the black lungs of cancer and denial. If she struggles to breathe, the doctor advised, give her an asthma inhaler. But tonight we sing happy birthday and blow out the candles together. Smoke trembles as if we all exhaled the same flammable wish. So um, my daughter is now, uh, she's gonna turn 10. Uh, this April in a couple weeks and yeah it seems like every every year in her birthday is, is the hottest April in history in the Pacific okay this next poem uh, is actually the very next poem in the book so it goes from fire to this poem which is about glaciers and uh, throughout this book I include several poems that I call recyclings where I basically take um, a famous poem and recycle its form and, and syntax and some of its its meanings, um, but uh, fill that container with uh, content related to our our contemporary times, uh, you know, specifically to to climate change and and the Anthropocene and so on. And so this poem is a recycling of Wallace Stevens, and my poem is called Thirteen Ways of Looking at a Glacier. And I should also say, you know. Growing up on a small tropical island, I didn't think of glaciers very much or, or ever saw them. Uh, you know, it really wasn't until the past like 10 years or so where I started learning more and, and paying attention at, and looking at glaciers. 13 ways of looking at a glacier. 13, among starving polar bears, the only moving thing was the edge of a glacier. 12, we are of one ecology, like a planet in which there were once 200,000 glaciers. 11, the glacier absorbs greenhouse gas. We are a large part of the biosphere. 10, humans and animals are kin. Humans and animals and glaciers are kin. Nine, we do not know which to fear more the terror of change or the terror of uncertainty, the glacier calving or just after. Eight, icebergs fill the vast ocean with titanic wrecks. The mass of the glacier disappears to and fro, the threat hidden in the crevasse and irreversible claws. Seven, oh, vulnerable humans, why do you engineer seawalls? Do you not see how the glacier already floods the streets of the cities around you? Six, I know king tides and lurid unprecedented storms, but I know too that the glacier is involved in what I know. Five, when the glacial terminus broke, it marks the beginning of one of many waves. Four, at the rumble of a glacier losing its equilibrium, every tourist in the new Arctic chased ice quickly. Three, Shell explored the poles for offshore drilling. Once we blocked them in that we understood the risk of an oil spill to a glacier. Two, the sea is rising. The glacier must be retreating. One, it was summer all winter. It was melting and it was going to melt. The last glacier fits in our warm hands. Okay, so the very next poem uh, takes us back to, to Hawaii. 
and uh, takes us to one of my daughter's favorite places, which is the, the Waikiki Aquarium. And this poem is titled, A Sonnet at the Edge of the Reef. We dip our hands into the outdoor reef exhibit and touch sea cucumber and red urchin as butterfly fish swim by. A docent explains, once a year after the full moon, when tides swell to a certain height and salt water reaches the perfect temperature, only then will the ocean cue coral polyps to spawn in synchrony a galaxy of gametes, which dances to the surface, fertilizes, opens, forms larvae, roots to seafloor, and grows generation upon generation. At home, we read a children's book, The Great Barrier Reef, to our daughters snuggling between us in bed. We don't mention corals bleaching, reared in labs or frozen, and isn't our silence too a kind of shelter? Um, so probably as, as most of you know, uh, coral bleaching is, is another major issue uh, across the Pacific, um, you know, partly due to, of course, uh, the rising ocean temperatures, ocean acidification, and compounded with, uh, you know, rising sea levels, it creates a, a very precarious situation uh, upon our shores. Uh, this next poem. Uh, it's kind of one that was was alluded to in the intro in the introduction. Uh, this poem is called "Care," and it was uh, written for World Refugee Day. And back when I wrote this poem, uh, it was during uh, the height of of the Syrian refugee crisis, which uh, of course also has connections to climate change. So I tried to uh, you know, kind of tie those two uh, phenomena together. Care. Our daughter wakes from her nap and cries. I pick her up, press her against my chest and whisper, daddy's here, daddy's here. Here is the island of Oahu, 8,500 miles from Syria. But what if Pacific trade winds suddenly became flames and shrapnel indiscriminately barreling towards us? What if shadows cast upon our windows aren't plumeria tree branches, but soldiers and terrorists marching? Daddy's here, daddy's here, I whisper. Would we reach the Mediterranean in time? Am I strong enough to straighten my legs into a mast balanced with the pull and drift of the currents? Am I brave enough to bear her across the razor wires of foreign countries and racial hatred. Could I plead, please help us. Please just let us pass. Please, we aren't suicide bombs. Could I keep walking if my feet crack like Halabi pepper fields after five years of drought, after this drought of humanity? Daddy's here, daddy's here. Trains and buses rock back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to detention centers. But what if our desperate boat capsizes? Could I inflate my body into a buoy to hold her above rough waves? Daddy's here, daddy. Will drowning be the last lullaby of the sea? Or will we carry each other towards the horizon of care? So yeah, just been thinking a lot about that that horizon of care, um, you know, both back then, but you know, in, in the years since then as well, and you know, not only the continuing uh, refugee crises in, in different countries due to to war. Um, but also, of course, uh, you know, refugee crisis and, and migration crisis that, you know, due to climate change and, and more, more is, is going to come as well. So, um, 
you know, thinking about that horizon and what we what we can and should carry each other, I think has has haunted me since I wrote that poem about seven years ago or so. Okay, this next poem uh, takes us back to another recycling. Uh, this is a recycling of, of Pablo Neruda's a famous sonnet 17. And I actually went a little crazy recycling Neruda uh, for a while. I think I maybe recycled like 30 of his love poems, but all with the theme of, of climate change. And one of them made into the book uh, and it's just, Generic, generically titled Love in a Time of Climate Change. And, and it's a sonnet, of course. Love in a Time of Climate Change. I don't love you as if you were rare earth metals, conflict diamonds, or reserves of crude oil that cause war. I love you as one loves the most vulnerable species, urgently, between the habitat and its loss. I love you as one loves the last seed saved within a vault, gestating the heritage of our roots. And thanks to your body, the taste that ripens from its fruit still lives sweetly on my tongue. I love you without knowing how or when this world will end. I love you organically without pesticides. I love you like this because we'll only survive in the nitrogen-rich compost of our embrace, so close that your emissions of carbon are mine, so close that your sea rises with my heat. So as I was uh, deep in these imitations of, of Neruda, you know, of course, so many of his uh, metaphors and symbols for love, desire, and the erotic is uh you know natural metaphors or metaphors of of the natural world and you know i started thinking about in the times we live in as as the natural world is changing and nature is no longer quote unquote nature uh, you know how does that change our how we write love poems as well and how we find uh, metaphors for love and so that was just one of the poems that came out of that kind of writing exper experiment Okay, so now I'm going to turn to the, the second section of this book, um, which focuses more on human-animal relations with kind of climate change as uh, a backdrop to these. Uh, the first one takes us to another one of my daughter's favorite places, which is the, the Honolulu Zoo. And we happen to, to go there during World Elephants Day. This poem is called Blood Ivory. When we reach the elephant enclosure, I lift our daughter up so she can see them playing in shallow ponds. Look, I say, they love the water just like you. Today, 96 elephants are being massacred across Africa's scarred savanna. Armed poachers surround the herds who stomp, trumpet, and encircle their calves. Bullets, those small human tusks, bite through thick, wrinkled skin? Do the men still feel awe or majesty, or do they only feel their own awful poverty as they sever the incisors once used to split bark and forage? Warlords will sell this white gold to be carved into jewelry, relics, and art, then smuggled across the planet, our man-made elephant graveyard. This year, 35,000 will be slain. Our daughter waves goodbye to them as we walk towards the exit. Do we build zoos to save what we've sacrificed, to display what we dominate, or to cage our own wild urge to kill every breathing being? Our daughter plays with a stuffed elephant doll in the gift shop. Look, I say has ears, eyes, and a mouth, just like you. She touches its tusks, smiles, then touches her own teeth. Okay, so this next poem 
Uh, it's another recycling, uh, this time uh, a recycling of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> of course, when my daughter was young, I was reading a lot of Dr. Seuss, so uh, the kind of form and, and rhythm of the poems kind of got into my imagination. And so I decided to recycle uh, one of his works. And this poem is called One Fish, Two Fish, Plastics, Dead Fish. Some fish are sold for sashimi, some are sold to canneries, and some are caught by hungry slaves to feed what wealthy tourists crave. Farm fish, fish sticks, frankenfish collapse. From the Pacific to the Atlantic, from the Indian to the Arctic, from here to there, dead zones are everywhere. Overfishing, purse scene, ghost fishing, bycatch. This one has a little radiation. This one has a little mercury. Oh me, oh my, what schools of bloated fish float by. Here are fish that used to spawn, but now the water is too warm. Some are predators and some are prey. Who will survive? I can't say. Say, look at its tumors. One, two, three. How many tumors do you see? Two fish, one fish. Phileo fish, no fish. And so, of course, obviously, I was thinking about um, you know the declining fish populations across the Pacific as well. Uh, you know, related both to to overfishing, of course, um, but also kind of connected to to ocean acidification as well. Okay, so uh, you know, I do write about food, as was mentioned in the intro. Uh, there are no spam poems in, in this book, sadly, but I do have a couple um, uh, meat poems. I'll share one with you. Uh, this meat poem is also recycling. It's a recycling of William Carlos Williams's This Is Just to Say, his very uh, famous poem about uh, the plums. And uh, this, po this poem kind of, you know, once again, takes the rhythm and syntax of of Williams's poem, but gives it a kind of Anthropocene a twist. All right, this is just to say, I have eaten the meats that were in the lab and which you were probably growing for burgers. Forgive me, they were impossible, trademark. So heme and so eco. In a twisted way, that's kind of my favorite poem <laughs> in this book. Because uh, I was so happy to get, you know, the end of that poem is like so sweet and so cold. Um, so I was trying to uh, recycle the sounds too. So no, so sweet became so heme, kind of referring to hemoglobin and, and that whole process of making these fake meats uh, taste kind of bloody. And then, of course, you know, so sweet and so cold, so so heme and so eco. I just love eco there, <laughs> there as a little adjective. Uh, anyways. Okay, this next poem is, is titled, We Aren't the Only Species. Who age, who change, who language, who pain, who play, who pray, who save, who mate, who native, who take, who break, who invade, who claim, who taste, who want, who talk, who crawl, who walk, who yawn, who trauma, who laugh, who care, who hear, who fear, who steal, who heal, who friend, who remember, who sex, who nest, who settle, who smell, who help, who eat, who feed, who greed, who sleep, who see, who need, who belong, who bleed, who speak, who breathe, who breathe, who breathe, who think, who drink, who sing, who thirst, who birth, who kill, who smile, who lick, who listen, who kiss, who give, who sick, who piss, who shit, who swim, who migrate, who die, who fight, who cry, who hide, who sign, who mourn, who mourn, who mourn, who work, who school, who tool, who colonize, who bond, who protect, who hope, who lose, who love, who lonely, who touch, who moan, who drown, who hurt, 
who hunt, who run, who hunger, who music, who nurse, who suffer, who build, who trust, who bury, who past, who present, who future, who house, who house, who house on this our only. Okay, just have uh, two more poems to share with you tonight. Uh, this next one is called The Last Safe Habitat. And uh, it's dedicated to uh, this native Hawaiian bird uh, called the Kauai O'o. It's a kind of a, a honey creeper. And uh, the, the song of, of this bird was last heard in, in the Hawaiian Islands in, in 1987. The Last Safe Habitat. I don't want our daughter to know that Hawaii is the bird extinction capital of the world. I don't want her to walk around the island feeling haunted by tree roots buried under concrete. I don't want her to fear the invasive predators who slither, pounce, bite, swallow, disease, and multiply. I don't want her to see paintings and photographs of birds she'll never witness in the wild. I don't want her to imagine their bones in dark museum drawers. I don't want her to hear their voice recordings on the internet. I don't want her to memorize and recite the names of 77 lost species and subspecies. I don't want her to draw a timeline in school with the years each was first collected and last cited. I don't want her to learn about the Kauai O'o, who was observed atop a flowering ohia tree, calling for a mate day after day, season after season, because he didn't know he was the last of his kind, until one day he disappeared forever into a nest of avian silence. I don't want our daughter to calculate how many miles of fencing is needed to protect the endangered birds that remain. I don't want her to realize the most serious causes of extinction can't be fenced out. I want to convince her that extinction is not the end. I want to convince her that extinction is just a migration to the last safe habitat on earth. I want to convince her that our winged relatives have arrived to their destination, a wondrous island with a climate we can never change and a rainforest fertile with seeds and song. Okay, my final poem um, was again written uh, several years ago and um, I wrote it for a, a solidarity event we had in Hawaii uh, to support uh, the tribe at Standing Rock. And of course, you know, water protectors uh, across uh, North America. And so in this poem, I try to make connections between water struggles uh, both in the Americas and the Pacific and, and around the world. Um, this poem is, is called Chanting the Waters, but it is kind of a call and response uh, poem. And so I'm going to ask you to participate. I know you you folks have had a long day and it's uh, almost five o'clock over, or I guess past five over there uh, on a Friday. But uh, if you're willing to, to participate with me, I appreciate it. Uh, all you have to do is when I say the word say, you say water is life. Okay, let's practice. Say. Say. Okay, I can't hear I can't hear you guys say, but I'm trusting your ears saying it. All right, let's let's I'll pause since I can't hear you. I'll just pause and uh, I'll, I'll try to feel your your words coming. Okay. Chanting the waters, say, because our bodies are 60% water, 
because she labored for 24 hours through contracting waves, because water breaks forth from shifting tectonic plates, say, because amniotic fluid is 90% water, because she breathed and breathed and breathed, because our lungs are 80% water, because our daughter crowned like a new island, say, because we tell creation stories about water, because our language flows from water, because our words are islands writ on water, because it takes more than three gallons of water to make a single sheet of paper, say. Because water is the next oil, because 180,000 miles of US oil pipelines leak every day, because we wage war over gods and water and oil, say because our planet is 70% water, because only 3% of global water is fresh water, because it takes two gallons of water to refine one gallon of gasoline, because it takes 20 gallons of water to make a pound of plastic, because the average American water footprint is 2,000 gallons a day, say, because a billion people lack access to drinking water because women and children walk four miles every day to gather clean water and deliver it home, say, because our bones are 30% water, because if you lose 5% of your body's water, you become feverish. If you lose 10% of your body's water, you become immobile, because our bodies won't survive a week without water, say, because corporations privatize, dam, and bottle our waters. Because plantations divert our waters. Because animal slaughterhouses consume our waters. Because pesticides, chemicals, lead, and waste poison our waters, say. Because they bring their bulldozers and drills and drones. Because we bring our feathers and lay and sage and shells and canoes and hashtags and totems. Because they call us savage and primitive and riot, because we bring our treaties and the declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, because they bring their banks and politicians and paychecks and pepper spray and bullets, because we bring our songs and schools and prayers and chants and ceremonies, because we say stop, keep the oil in the ground, because they say shut up and vanish, but we are not moving because we bring all our relations and all our generations and all our live streams, say. Because our drumming sounds like rain after drought echoing against taut skin. Because our skin is 60% water, say. Because every year millions of children die from waterborne diseases. Because every day thousands of children die from waterborne diseases. Because by the end of this poem, five children will die from waterborne diseases, say. Because our daughter loves playing in the ocean. Because someday she'll ask, where does the ocean end? Because we'll point to the dilating horizon. Because our eyes are 95% water because we'll tell her ocean has no end, because sky and clouds lift ocean, because mountains embrace ocean into blessings of rain, because ocean sky rain fills aquifers and lakes, because ocean sky rain lake flows into the Missouri River, because ocean sky rain lake river returns to the Pacific and connects us to our cousins at Standing Rock, because our blood is 90% water say, because our hearts are 75% water, because I'll teach our daughter our people's word for water, hanum, 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 so the sound of water will always carry her home, say, 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 Thank you. I couldn't hear you say water is life, but uh, it was beautiful to imagine in my imagination and in those in those silent spaces. Um, and so thank you again for for listening to my poems, for inviting me to uh, be in conversation with all of you. And uh, I believe we have some time left for, for Q&A as well.
Yes, yes. Uh, thank, thank you so much uh, for that. The, just hearing you read poems that we've read together before, uh, just bringing out the rhythms and the repetitions and uh, just the, the, the ironic twists, the, the, the humor and the grief and the rage. It, it just was such a powerful experience. So thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Who would like to ask a question? Kate. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm a fourth year undergrad here. And I just want to say I really love and enjoy your poetry. And I think it's so cool how you recycle poems. So I was just wondering how you started doing that and how you choose which poem to recycle. Yes, thank you for, for the first question. Um, so when I was an MFA student, I, I had an awesome professor who, like as one of our writing exercises, would have us do imitations of famous poems. And I really love that exercise because it kind of got me out of my own, uh, you know, just my own tendencies and habits and really, you know, forced me to be in you know another poet's like syntax and forms and it, it really was you know just a great kind of writing exercise um, to kind of hone my skills and to try out different styles and, and things like that so it's a practice I've always done um, for this book you know I started doing that as well but instead of calling them imitations or, or saying like it's after this poet or this poem it, it made more sense thematically to call them recycling since you know the whole theme of this book is is about uh the environment and you know when i was choosing poems to recycle you know i wanted to to write a poem about glaciers reflecting on glaciers and because i was looking at them and you know watching documentaries about glaciers kind of stevens's poem made sense for me to uh try to recycle in order to write about glaciers and you know, so that worked well for me. And, and one of the kind of revisions I did was instead of kind of numbering them from like one to 13, it, it's a descending countdown. So it goes from 13 to one. And so I thought that would be an interesting way to reflect upon the disappearance of, of glaciers as we are just, or as some of us are just beginning to, to look at them. Um, you know, I also, <laughs> I wanted to write a poem about the impossible burgers and you know, Williams's poem about the plums, you know, made sense to me because it's a kind of iconic food poem. And I was just also thinking about, well, what if we get to the point where, you know, these impossible meats are, you know, as natural or, or normal as, as plums were in, in that poem, and that they're also these kind of, you know, food fetish objects too. And so, you know, that poem made sense for me to try to recycle in terms of writing about impossible meats or fake meats. Um, and then, you know, the Dr. Seuss one, as I said, that was just came out of my personal life, just reading a lot of children's books to my daughter. And um, and then the, the Naruto one, you know, of course, very famous. I wanted to write a poem about, you know, like love in the time of climate change. And you know, he's kind of the most well-known love poet. So that was why I chose, chose to do that one. And what's fun is after I wrote this book, I've, I've continued, continued doing imitations and I, I continued doing it during the pandemic. But instead of recyclings or imitations, uh, I, I call them variants. <laughs> and so I, I do have a poem called uh, 13 Ways of, of Looking at a Virus. And kind of, again, you know, thinking about, you know, that theme of like looking at viruses, but, you know, again, through, through the kind of imitation style and thinking about, um, you know, again, a metaphor of variance and change and how the pandemic has kind of changed the way, at least I was writing poems at the time. But anyways, that's a little bit about background about those recycling poems. Happy day, Craig. Um, I was wondering um, about your concept of way reading, which I, I find very, very useful. And um, I like the one of the many things it does is, is sort of 
recenter the world around the Pacific, around Guahan. And I was wondering, therefore, what a sort of reorganized canon, a way reading canon might look like. Like in a, obviously in a very minimal <laughs> form, but but where would you know how would you what would the diasporic diasporic canon look like with Wuhan at its its center? Well, it's great to see you again and, and to hear your voice. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know, way reading is it, actually referring to my my academic book, which I have here, uh, called Navigating Tomorrow Poetry. So in this book. I basically just develop a kind of indigenous literary methodology for reading uh, Pacific Islander and, and more specifically Chamorro poetry. Uh, and I call it way reading. And it's a play off of wayfinding or, or navigational practices. And, you know, as I kind of develop this practice of way reading, it's essentially, um, you know, thinking about how to navigate uh, contemporary indigenous poetry and you know how to then you know interpret and highlight all of its complexities and you know this this methodology you know involves as you said kind of centering um indigenous literary traditions customs aesthetic practices and, and so on and so each chapter of, of that academic book um i i way read uh, different uh, literary texts um, using this this method and you know it's not necessarily at least in my opinion you know it's not like revolutionary it's, it's very much grounded in the tradition of indigenous literary studies and and, and especially Native American literary studies uh, thinking about how you know many scholars have grounded their literary interpretations within uh, you know, native epistemologies, uh, aesthetics, and as well as, of course, like history, a uh, political and cultural context. Um, you know, in terms of your question about kind of what would a, a diasporic, you know, poetics or or method methodology look like, I think it's very similar, because you know, as a diasporic uh, Pacific Islander, I'm also always trying to navigate. Uh, you know, being away from home. Uh, thinking about where I belong, um, as well as how to remain, you know, connected to to my culture, and so, you know, for me, you know, so much of my life is is both trying to navigate to way find or or to way read, and you know, I feel like writing and poetry really helps me do that in a way, and so. Uh, you know, I like to think about navigation a lot, not only as a form of, of writing and, you know, moving through the world and just living life, um, but I found it also a, a useful kind of metaphor for uh, interpreting literary text too, and, and reading itself as a form of, of navigation or wayfinding, because when we read, of course, we're interpreting signs and, you know, trying to find our way to let's say a destination being maybe the deeper meanings of a text. Uh, we often get lost when, when we read sometimes as well. And, you know, that's part of its pleasures too, to get lost in a text, but to find our way uh, through it, whether it be, you know, through the plot or through through other uh, poetic uh, techniques and, and, and genres and so on. So that's a little bit of background. I mean, it's hard to just gloss that a little bit, but, you know, definitely if folks are interested in, and like Pacific literary studies, uh, I do cite a lot of scholars in, in my book. So, um, as well as a lot of Native American literary scholars too. But yeah, thank you for that question. Wonderful. Um, would you be willing to take maybe one or, or possibly even two quick quick questions to, to end? Is you, you, is, would that be okay? Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm in uh, California right now, so it's, it's still early in the afternoon. Okay. All right, <laughs> wonderful. Um, Chris Hi, I'm Kristen. I'm an MA student at here at UVA. Um, I was curious, especially um, hearing you read Age of Plastic and Rings of Fire. Um, what led you to kind of, um, you know, embody this sense of environmental harm and kind of interweave, you know, um, human sensation, human bodily sensation with the harm that is happening to the environment? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, in, in those two poems, um, you know, I was thinking, well, in the first poem, I'm thinking a lot, of course, about, uh, you know, not only plastic pollution as like visible material, but also some of the uh, invisible uh, impacts that that plastic can have on our bodies. And, um, you know, thinking about, you know, the the kind of connections and, and intimacies that our bodies have with, uh, you know, chemical substances and, uh, you know, how there's a kind of, you know, what one scholar calls transcorporeality, like this almost borderlessness between our bodies and the world. And, you know, both uh, uh, Brian and Margaret, you know, to the other folks involved in the symposium, you know, they do write, write about in their work in amazing ways. And so for me, I wanted to also try to capture um, that connection between our, our bodies and then, you know, various elements, the environment, chemicals, and, and so on. Um, and the Rings of Fire, you know, one of the triggers for that poem was um, th these fires that were burning in, in parts of, of Indonesia, where they were uh, burning the rainforest to plant uh, palm oil plantations. And a lot of that smoke ended up, uh, you know, getting picked up by the wind and, and spread throughout the Pacific. And so it was, and then, you know, people were breathing in the smoke and that was impacting uh, their bodies and so on. And so, you know, of course, in California, you know, that happens during the wildfires. Um, and so I was thinking about, you know, smoke and fire as another kind of transcorporeal element of which, uh, you know, our bodies are, are intimately connected to as we breathe in smoke. Um, and so I was trying to capture those, those interconnections and, you know, so much of, of my environmental poetry, eco-poetry is about uh, articulating an, an eco-consciousness or an awareness that, you know, everything is interconnected. And so I tried to show those interconnections, whether it be between our bodies and nature or between the self and other, um, between, you know, Hawaii or the Pacific and, and other parts of the world. And, you know, so, and I love the way that poetry, you know, through its, you know, kind of lyric associations and ability to uh, move across time and space, even just from line to line or stanza to stanza, that I think poetry can powerfully articulate uh, those interconnections and, uh, you know, perhaps show us uh, what a, a eco-consciousness can look like when we start seeing how we are connected to all things, to animals, to, to other people, and um, to, you know, kind of embrace that diversity um, and the kind of borderlessness of our worlds while still being uh, cognizant of our own you know, positionalities and subjectivities and, and localities and and physicalities and, and so on. Beautiful. Um, if, uh, we have one more person who's dying to ask you a question. I'm sure there are many more, but we'll, we'll end with this uh, last question, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Stella. I'm an undergrad here at UVA. Um, you were my first kind of poet that I've read at UVA, and I greatly really enjoyed that. You kind of set a high bar. Um, <laughs> This is honestly more about your approach to poetry. I was very, very, very touched by how you spoke about your daughter, um, especially all the love that came into your face and that's clearly written within the poetry itself. Um, and I was wondering how your daughter has changed your view of the world and climate change and whether or not she's made you more hopeful about the future or whether or not she's made you more fearful and how that kind of shows within your poetry. Uh -huh. A great question. I'm, I'm glad I could, um, you know, be one of the first poets you read and and, ha and that had been a positive experience. So thanks for saying that. Um, I think a little bit of both, definitely, you know, being a, a new parent at the time, I felt lots of anxieties and worries, uh, you know, just about caring for this very vulnerable uh, being. And you know, and then just learning more about climate change at the time. And of course, you know, all just the horrible things that were happening in, in the world. 
uh, yeah, it was really just very stressful, very stressful. And, you know, the poems really came a, a space for me to kind of process my anxieties and, and really reckon uh, with with the troubling world that that we live in. Um, and, you know, then just wanting to write into that. So, so many of the poems, you know, feature my daughter and, you know, for me, that was also a way that I could ground some of, you know, maybe some of the more intellectual or, or philosophical things in the poem, uh, kind of, I could ground it into like the personal, the familial and, and even the domestic. And for me, it, it made the poems uh, so much more powerful when they had that personal element. And at least in the book, it became a nice counterpoint to some of the other poems, like the Glacier poem, which are more impersonal, right? They don't, not necessarily about me specifically. Um, it has more of an omniscient nar narrative voice, whereas some of the other per poems are, are really personal. Um, and so, you know, all that said, you know, I think, yes, by the end of this book, I was... I do have a poem where I talk about hope a little bit more, um, but the way I write about hope is, and how others have too, is, is thinking about hope as, you know, as a practice, um, as almost like a, a muscle or instinct, something that we have to continually nourish and cultivate, uh, especially given everything that's, that's happening in our world. Um, and definitely, you know, seeing her grow up and have such a, like a childlike and innocent, um, wondrous and awe-filled way of looking at the world was really inspiring to me. Like just taking her to the ocean for the first time and seeing how she reacted to the water or how she like reacted to touching the sand, how much she loves animals. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just like that beautiful, being around that, just that innocent, like, uh, wonder, seeing the world in such wondrous eyes. And I want her to like, hold on for that, hold on to that for so long, because I know at some point, you know, she's going to have to face the realities of, of this world and of climate change and animal extinction and, and so on. And so, you know, during the writing of this book, I was really like wanting to shield her and protect her. Um, and kind of wanting to be that that coral reef for her, right? She's this very vulnerable island. And as a parent, I wanted to be the reef to protect her. Um, sure. And I wanted to, you know, as the one poem says, to convince her that extinction is not the end. You know, so I want her to kind of have this wondrous imagination that um, hopefully, you know, when she does get older and have to reckon with with the realities of our world, that she can still feel that childlike love uh, for the world and that will hopefully maybe inspire her uh, to then <laughs> perhaps like join the youth climate movement and and things like that. So uh, yes, I do feel hope, uh, but also at the same time, it's, you know, I don't think I ever only feel hope, but it's always already mixed with, you know, anxiety as well. But um, yeah, it has been, you know, to write these poems over a certain amount of years and to see her also grow up during that time. Um, you know, it's both an, an amazing experience, but also terrifying. Greg, thank you for your eloquence, your time, your passion, the knowledge you've brought to all of this and sharing uh, all, the wonder of all your work with us. Um, this is This is an experience I'm sure uh, we will we will not forget. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for dedicating time and resources to this important topic. And uh, I wish those of you who travel to symposium that you return safely to your homes. And for all the students, I, I wish you the best of luck uh, the rest of your your term. Thank you so much. And uh, we wish you could join us for the reception we're going to go to <laughs> now, but alas, even spam can't travel uh, quite at that velocity. So 
Thank you. Uh, so hopefully you have some impossible burgers uh, on my <laughs> <laughs> uh, But yeah, enjoy the reception.